Okay, folks, um, this is the time to start our uh, new online course. Um, I am uh, Professor Cromie, and this is 137B. Um, and this is the second semester of quantum mechanics. Um, and so I'm having some technical difficulties with all this online stuff, but I hopefully it will work out. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. Uh, let's begin um, with the syllabus. So uh, go get your syllabuses. I'm assuming that you guys got it from B courses. Take a look at your syllabus. Let's just go over that very quickly. That's where I'd like to start. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a copy of the syllabus on my, on my iPad. I'm assuming that you have it in front of you. So uh, let's just say a few things. Uh, the GSI for this course is Newton Chang. Um, uh, the text is Quantum Mechanics 3rd Edition by Griffiths. Uh, I'm just reading this stuff fast because you guys uh, should all have it on a, in a Word document. The grading um, for this course will be um, uh, the midterm is worth 30%, the final exam is 43%, and the homework is 27%. Uh, the homework policy is that um, <clears throat> uh, we will typically post the homework on B courses uh, sometime on Tuesday, um, uh, Tuesday afternoon typically, uh, and then it, the homework will be due Friday of the next week, the week after. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and also uh, the policy of this course is that there will be no late homework will be accepted. Uh, so that means that the homework will be due on Friday, and then typically we will post the solutions the next day, Saturday, Sunday, or, or maybe Monday. Um, we'll post the solutions, and so we don't accept late homework. However, I do appreciate that um, there are many situations in which case you guys cannot do uh, uh, your homework. You know, I understand that you might get sick or have some, some personal crisis. Uh, and so what you can do in that case is send me an email uh, explaining in the subject of the email, put the which homework you're talking about, and then in the body of the email, just give me a couple sentence explanation why you cannot uh, do your homework that week. And then what I will do is I just will not not I will I will drop that homework. I will not count it toward your grade. So um, if you have a reasonable excuse, then I will just drop that homework. Okay, but you gotta you gotta tell me. Uh, otherwise, because we just cannot deal with late homework, so that's that's too complicated. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's talk about the course content. Um, this is the second semester of quantum, so I'm going to assume that you all took 137A last semester or or some equivalent course. Uh, this semester, the main topics will be uh, systems of identical particles, addition of angular momentum. Uh, perturbation theory will be a big part of this course. Time independent perturbation theory, the variational principle, WKB, uh, and then time-dependent perturbation theory is a really important topic in this course, uh, Fermi's Golden Rule, scattering, uh, and then advanced topics, time permitting, well, actually, <laughs> time will not permit, there will not be much extra time, however, uh, I'm hoping that there'll be a little bit of time, and I'll give, hopefully I'll be able to give a, a one or two lectures on the Dirac equation, just to give you guys a little uh, introduction to that advanced topic at, at the end. I'm hoping we'll have <clears throat> time for one or two lectures on the Dirac equation, which is pretty interesting. Uh, okay, so um, let's talk about books for this course. Um, <clears throat> um, you really should use other books for this course. Uh, there is really no great single quantum mechanics book that just sort of nails everything. Uh, uh, there just It just doesn't exist. Uh, the, the course for this book... The book for this course is, uh, as I said before, the Griffiths book, third edition, which is a very nice book, but it's not perfect. Um, it doesn't, I don't like how it does everything. Uh, and so really what you should do is, is get other books. Um, I would suggest if possible that go to a used bookstore or, or eBay or something and just try to pick up some some used books. It's really nice to have a few quantum mechanics books because then uh, if you don't understand something, then different authors often explain quantum mechanics very differently. Griffiths is is very good. He's really good at explaining things, much better than, for example, Leboff, I think. Uh, Griffiths is pedagogically 
talented. Uh, but nevertheless, he some things he just doesn't you know do well, uh, and so uh, but but that's very much subjective, <clears throat> and so if there's some topic that's not making sense to you, I really suggest that you look at other books because the different books will explain things very differently and one of them will be the right book you know one explanation will be the one that works for you and of course you should also go and you can you can talk, go to the uh, the TA uh there'll be office hours um we are blessed this um this 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 semester we we have Newton Chang is is the GSI the main the head GSI um um, let me make sure I'm getting his, spelling his name right. And so <clears throat> you should uh, get in contact with him uh, for, for office hours. Uh, but then uh, we also have another uh, uh, tutor for this course called uh, Juan Carlos. Um, and he will be, oh shoot, I, I didn't bring his, that's actually his, uh, his name is Juan Carlos. Um, and then, and then, uh, you can also contact Juan Carlos, and they will both be having office hours. Uh, and so you can uh, uh, go to their office hours. Uh, or or uh, the way that I'm doing this course is that um, my office hour, uh, the lectures will be posted. Lectures posted on Tuesday and Thursday. But we will have a zoom meeting on friday more on friday mornings 9 to 10 a.m so then we can talk you can ask me questions during that time or you can uh do the piazza or uh you can email email me questions um and so we can so if you have questions and hopefully we'll be able to figure it out you have a lot of resources here you have Piazza, you can email me, we can make an appointment if necessary, but we will see each other face to face on Friday. And you also can email and make appointments with Newton or Juan Carlos. And I just want to say that uh, uh, Newton is a theorist who's, who's actually a theorist doing uh, quantum information. So Newton is like uh, a really smart guy who understands quantum mechanics at a very deep level, uh, deeper, <laughs> deeper than I understand it. Um, so, you know, you have good resources here. Um, um, okay. And in this, in the syllabus, I also have recommended some books. Uh, I will not just go through those books, but I've listed a bunch of books that I think are good and you can take a look at them. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see. Um, now I think it's time for us to just dive into the topic of the course. Now it's time for the actual physics. Um, and so today, uh, what we will do is uh, I will um, give a lightning review of spin. Spin review. Very quick review because I'm assuming that you all have learned spin last semester. So that's sort of an assumption that I'm making. So if you did not learn spin and what spin is, then um, I suggest that you, you really should, you know, uh, read it, read the spin chapter, read, read a chapter on spin from your favorite quantum mechanics textbook, and you have to learn that topic. Um, and, um, and so I'm, I'm assuming that you already know this topic, but if you, if you don't, then please go out and learn it. Uh, talk to the TA, ask questions ask me questions, um, <clears throat> but I'm assuming that you know spin. Uh, and so today I will give a quick review of spin so you have a sense of what you need to know. Uh, and then what I will do is uh, the next topic that we will discuss are systems of identical particles and what that means and why that is important. And so that, that's kind of cool. That's a very new topic. Uh, for you guys, if uh, I'm assuming that's something that's not typically not covered in 137A, uh, and uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, so, all right, so let's start. So let's start with spin. <clears throat> so uh, what is spin? So spin is uh, intrinsic angular momentum. Intrinsic 
angular momentum. And so it is as though, uh, and so if I have an electron or a particle, uh, spin is, um, it's sort of, you, the way you can think about it is you can think of a particle as a little uh, sphere, and it's, you can think of it as rotating on an axis, um, and then it has some uh, angular momentum. And so the angular momentum of the particle as it rotates on that axis is, you can think of it as spin. <coughs> angular momentum equals spin. Now, of course, um, that is not a correct statement uh, because uh, in, in actuality, particles are not rotating on an axis. Uh, particles are point particles like an electron. And so this is really not a true physical picture. Uh, uh, spin is actually an intrinsic angular momentum. It, it has nothing to do with actually physically rotating. Um, but, but this picture in, you can have in your mind of the particle rotating is, is a very useful one that really works. Uh, it, it helps you to create intuition in your mind for dealing with spin. So if you think of the particle as literally spinning on a, its own axis, that's a useful physical picture, even though it's not really correct. Uh, because really to understand what spin is, uh, you, it comes from the Dirac equation. And the Dirac equation is basically the um, relativistic, uh, relativistic Schrodinger equation. In other words, it's it's the equivalent of the Schrodinger equation, but uh, it takes into account relativity. And when you take into account relativity in quantum mechanics, then you find that spin is a consequence of that. It, it turns out that uh, particles, uh, in order for the Schrodinger equation to work uh, under relativistic conditions, particles have to have spin, uh, intrinsic angular momentum. And, and I, I, <laughs> there's nothing more I'm going to say about it than that. That, because that's all we can say for this course. Uh, but, but what it means, though, <clears throat> so uh, for the particle to have intrinsic angular, mo angular momentum, it means that spin is an observable. It's something that you can measure in quantum mechanics. Spin is an observable. And if it's an observable, that means that there's, a, that there's an operator. It is represented by an operator. And that's the rules that you learned from last semester. Every observable is represented by an operator in, in quantum mechanics. And so the spin operator, it's an, ang it's an angular momentum, so it's a vector. Uh, that means it has an x component. And uh, it has a y component. And I'm putting these little hats to indicate that it's an operator. Uh, j, that's the unit vector in the y direction, plus z. It's a, it's a vector. It has x, y, and z components. Um, and so since it's an angular momentum, you guys know the, the rules uh, of commutation for angular momentum. Uh, for angular momentum, you guys know it from last semester. You guys derived it all. And those rules are that we have um, the x component of the angle of momentum, um, the commutator of the x component with the y component is equal to, you guessed it, the z component. That's the uh, commutator rules. Uh, and you can circulate those indices uh, as you want. Um, and um, so the various, uh, the various components of angle of momentum do not commute, but you have this very special commutator relationship. It's the, basically the same as orbital angular momentum, same commutator relationship as orbital angular momentum. Uh, and from that commutator relationship, you can then derive all the properties of angular momentum. And I'm not gonna go through the der derivation because I'm assuming that you guys learned it all last time, uh, but I'll just sort of do, this is like a lightning review. Uh, so we know that uh, we can uh, define uh, S squared the, the magnitude squared of, this, of the spin vector, that's an operator. And S squared uh, is simply equal to S dot S, right? And that's equal to Sx squared plus Sy squared plus Sz squared. Uh, and so if I define, and this is, these are operators. And so if I define that as the S squared operator, uh, I'll just call it S squared. I won't do all this 
vector notation that's too tedious. But if we define that operator, then it's very simple to show that S squared commutes with every component um, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the angular momentum uh, vector. Uh, and this could be SZ or SX or SY. Uh, so S squared commutes with all the different components of the angular momentum vector. Um, and so what that means, uh, since these two operators uh, commute, then what that means is that I can write a sim. So then, since they commute, that means that I can have a simultaneous uh, eigenvector of those two operators. And so that means that there exists, there exists some states, some eigenstates, which can be simultaneous eigenstates uh, uh, of S squared and SZ. So there exist these states which are uh, simultaneous eigenstates. Simultaneous eigenstates of S squared and SZ. Since S squared and SZ commute. Um, and so uh, what that means then is that those that those um, those eigenstates must have eigenvalues, and so uh, then we can find out what what are the eigenvalues. Eigenvalues, what are they? And you can figure it out using uh, some uh, ladder operators and some algebra that you guys did last semester. Ladder, I'll just say ladder operators, operators. S plus, S minus, etc. You can do all that ladder operator stuff, and I'm not going to do it because I'm assuming you did it last semester, but I'm just sort of reminding you of what you did last time. And using all those ladder operators, then you can figure out uh, what the eigenstates are, what the eigenvalues are. And the eigenvalues are as follows. We see that S squared uh, acting on this eigenstate gives me an eigenvalue of H bar squared S times S plus 1, and S, where, where S is equal to um, some uh, integer or half integer, N over 2, where uh, N is an integer. So that means that S can be either an integer or a half integer. Um, and then, um, which is, remember, that's different from L different from L, since for L, we remember the eigenstates of, of L squared uh, have to be integers. Remember that? Uh, I won't get too much into that, but spin, th that's the uh, a main difference is that spin can take on half integer values, whereas uh, orbital angle momentum uh, can only take on um, uh, integer values uh, for L squared. Uh, okay, uh, and then we see that the uh, we can also find that the eigenvalue of the SZ operator is going to be h bar uh, times m, where of course m uh, is going to can be uh, any number that ranges from plus s to s minus one, etc. to um, as we keep going down, uh, s minus 2, etc., to minus s. So all, uh, all, all the increments from plus s to minus s. Um, okay, and so we see that there are uh, 2s plus 1 states for, for a spin. Uh, and so um, what we can do then is um, we, we know that... Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, particles uh, have spin. They have intrin particles have spin, but the amount of spin they have depends on which particle they are. So um, uh, uh, particles have an amount of spin. Uh, so s, the eigenvalue s, is intrinsic to each particle. So each particle has its own eigenvalue of s squared. So that's the eigenvalue. That's the eigenvalue of the 
the uh, uh that's the the eigen number the uh, the quantum number for the s squared operator and so that's an intrinsic property for each particle and so uh let's talk about some some particles for example um let's talk about the electron uh, which is the most important particle, in my opinion, because I'm a condensed matter person. Uh, and so electrons are very important in condensed matter. And so for the electron, the uh, eigenvalue of S is one half. Okay, so we see that uh, that electrons all have S equals one half. They, are, they have a half spin. Um, and so that means that for an electron, then... For each electron, uh, there then are going to be uh, two states. Since we see then that um, if I have um, S equals plus one half, then what happens is we see then that the M value can either equal um, plus one half or, one, or, or, or S minus one, which is minus one half so that's the that's the whole range from plus s to minus s so there's two states uh, and so then the two spin states for so the two two spin states for a spin one half particle for s equals one half i can write them as um well the best way to write them would be like this i could say that the the, the SM states are either S equals one half and M equals plus one half, or S equals one half and M equals minus one half. So this is really would be the most accurate way to write uh, those two spin states. But of course, that's pretty tedious notation. There's only two, and so we don't. No one likes to write all that stuff. And so what we really like to do is we can just give them simpler names. We can call them uh, either plus and minus, or sometimes we'll call them just up and down. Uh, but when we, um, but when we use this simplified notation, then you have to remember that this is, this simplifi this is really simplified notation is really referring to these two states. So we can say that, so I could say for example that plus is equal to one half, one half, and minus is equal to one half minus one half. <clears throat> or, or, or I could call them up or down. So people use all those notations. Um, and, and, but because these are, um, because there's, there's two states, we can also write these two states. Another way of writing it would be using vector notation. Because remember, states in quantum mechanics can also be represented as vectors. Vectors in Hilbert space, right? Vectors in Hilbert space. Hilbert space. Um, and so that means then that uh, what I could do is I can take those two spin states for spin one-half particles and I can label them. I can write them like this. I could write them as... Um, uh, I could write plus as as one zero and I could write minus as zero one since there's only two states so the the Hilbert space is just a two-dimensional Hilbert space because there's there's only two uh, there's only two basis vectors and so it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space uh, and so um, we can then say that the most general state the most general state, spin state, then is a linear superposition. I can write like this, chi is equal to some superposition of spin up plus uh, some, some, uh, com some component of spin down. So this is a linear superposition of spin up spin down but of course if we just do the simple uh, vector um, algebra then you can see that a times one zero is going to be a zero 
nb times 0, 1 is going to be 0b. And if I add those two vectors, then it's just ab. So we can see that the most general spin state is going to be ab. But this, of course, is equivalent to a times uh, spin up plus b times spin down. It's the same thing, just different ways of writing the same thing. And I've, I wrote it all these different ways just to remind you guys, just to get you back in the mood for doing this, these kinds of manipulations. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so what we can do then is we can, uh, this, this vector notation is very convenient. And so using the vector notation, then um, vector notation for spin one half particles, then we can write out, we can, we can then write out what the spin operators look like for a spin one half particle. Because um, we, we have a two dimensional Hilbert space, 2D Hilbert space. And so that means that the operators in a two dimensional Hilbert space have to be, uh, you guessed it, a two by two matrix. Because the objects in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, then the objects in that Hilbert space are, are two-dimensional vectors. And so if I'm going to operate on a two-dimensional vector, then the thing that operates on it is a, is a two-by-two matrix. And so we can then, um, so w what we can do is <clears throat> we, can, we can figure out what those matrices are. Because if I have spin is equal to Sx, I plus S Y J plus S Z K, then uh, it's convenient for me to rewrite this in this way. It's it's convenient for me to to rewrite it as uh, right here below as uh, H bar over two. This is just a different notation. Sigma X I plus H bar over two sigma Y J. This is just convention plus h bar over 2. It makes the units easier when we do this. Uh, K, so I can just rename my spin, my spin components uh, in this way, uh, you know, where these things are the same, see? And if I do that, then what we can do is um, we can then figure out what these operators are. What, what then are sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z? What, what are they? Well, what we can do, it's really easy to find out because we know that they must be two by two matrices, but what, what are they? So let's do, we can do, we can do, for example, um, sig, let's figure out what sigma x, let's figure out what sigma x is. Sigma x is, it's got to be some um, matrix, matrix, so it's got to have a one, one component, and it's going to have a, a one, two component, and it's going to have a, a two, one component, and it's going to have a, to two component. And so if we want to figure out what those components are, then that's really easy because then we know that if we want to find the sigma x one one component, then that's just going to be, we take state one on the left, we take the operator, and we take state two on the right. Um, and so in this case, what's what happens is that state one is going to be uh, the up um, is going to be our, our up, and state 2, of course, is going to be down, spin down. And so what I have to do is I have to figure out what this uh, matrix element is. And when you figure it out, then what you'll find uh, if you do some of the algebra, and I'm not going to do this algebra, but if you, you have to uh, you'll have to express, for example, S sigma X in terms of ladder operators, ladder operators. And when you do that, you'll find that um, sigma X one one is equal to zero. And you'll find that uh, sigma X one two is equal to one, etc. If you if you do all the all the all the math, which I'm assuming that you have done, and when you do all that, you can then figure out what these operators are. You can see that sigma x, which is represents the x component of spin, is a matrix, which is 0, 1, 1, 0. And sigma y is a matrix. If you do that same 
uh, procedure, and it's going to be 0 minus i, i0, and you have sigma, sigma z is going to be uh, 1, 0, 0 minus 1, and so, um, <clears throat> and then, um, so these, of course, are the famous Pauli matrices, Pauli matrices, they're so famous and useful that we give them a special name. These are the Pauli matrices, which <coughs> represent the, uh, the XYZ component of the spin operator for S equals 1 half. Uh, spin operators for S equals 1 half particle. Um, okay, and so then, of course, we can do, you can do, now you can do all your, all your various uh, manipulations. For example, if someone says that a particle for example, has, is in some spin state, say chi is equal to a, b, and so someone could then say, uh, what is the uh, expectation value of the x component of spin? I could ask you that. In other words, if I measured, if I had an ensemble of particles and I measured the x component of the spin for all of them using some uh, Stern-Gerlach machine, then what would, I, what would be the average of all the measurements? So this is actually physical. Uh, and then you would say, then you could, you could calculate it because then you say, well, um, the expectation value of an operator is simply uh, I take the state because the expectation value is always for some state, uh, chi. And so, the expect so then I have to take chi on the left and then I sandwich it with chi on the right. That's the definition of expectation value, which you learned last semester. Um, and so then... Uh, we just have to do this expectation value. And so chi, and so this is just some vector. This is just a, uh, a, 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 a linear algebra quantity. It's just a vector, vector multiplication, vector times a matrix times a vector. Uh, vector, uh, that's what this is. And so then that's just going to be if you if you do all the nota all the notation correctly, then you'll get a b uh, times uh, the um, the spin operator, which is going to be s x is going to be h bar over two times um, uh, sigma x, which is zero one one zero. Is that sigma x? Because that's what s x is. It's h bar over two times sigma x times um, a, B. So we're just doing this, the vector multiplication correctly. And when you do all that, um, then you'll get, um, you can figure it all out. It'll be uh, H bar over 2, H bar over 2 times uh, A, B plus B, A. When you work through the details, and I'll leave that for you guys to do. But I just want to give you that example. Um, and so then we can, we can do things like, Okay, so that, that's just kind of a, a quick review of like the mathematics of spin. I just wanted to remind you of that, get, get you back in the mood for quantum mechanics. Um, but then we can start asking things like, okay, you know, what, why, how do you, you know, how do you actually measure this? Like, what, what are the physical observables? Like, what would you really, um, why, is, why is spin important, like, if, to an experimentalist? And for an experimentalist, then what we always care about um, is energy energy you know because if spin is a real observable then it should sort of affect the energy of the particle uh, and so and you know because to, to measure something and grab onto it uh, usually uh, we need that quantity to somehow affect the energy of the particle and so how does what is the relationship between the spin of a particle and the energy of the particle because that's when things get interesting is when uh, energy becomes involved because then that then the experimentalist can can start measuring things. Um, okay, well, so so what does spin have to do with energy? Well, uh, <clears throat> the question then becomes: um, If I'm talking about energy, then we got to be talking about Hamiltonian. So, in other words, if I'm talking about energy, then uh, we have to ask: How does spin? Uh, 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 fit into the Hamiltonian of a particle uh, because energy is, is an observable and so the uh, operator 
then that corresponds to energy is the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> so this is the observable, and this is the operator. And this is just review from last semester get to get you guys back in the mood for quantum. Um, and so, <clears throat> so how, how do we uh, get an energy uh, out of, out of um, uh, spin? Well, the, 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 the critical thing to remember uh, is that, um, and, and this is the key point, uh, and, and this is actually not, not completely uh, obvious, uh, but the key point is that um, if a charged particle, if a charged particle, I was right here, if charged particle has spin, then that particle has a magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment is uh, mu, and the magnetic moment is equal to the charge of the particle times the g factor divided by twice the mass of the particle times spin. And to be quite honest, this is not a completely obvious thing. I mean, if the particle was charged and it was rotating on its axis, then it does seem kind of intuitive. Like, so if the particle has charge and it's spinning, then it makes sense that it has a magnetic moment, right? Then, because you guys learned that in classical mechanics. But the reality is, and so that so it kind of makes sense, but the reality is that the particle is not actually spinning physically. And so the origin of this magnetic moment is, is not totally obvious. It's not obvious why where this relationship comes from, but I'll just tell you, it comes from the Dirac equation. So if you knew the Dirac equation, then this, this result is a natural consequence of the Dirac equation. Uh, but, but we don't know the Dirac equation yet, so, so and I'm not going to derive that for you now. Maybe at the end of the course I'll derive that for you. But for now, let's just take it as a given. Let's take it as a given, an ansatz. And so uh, if a particle then has a magnetic moment mu, uh, equals Q times G over 2M, and uh, for, for part of, for um, f the G factor uh, is different for different particles, but for electrons, electrons, then the G factor is 2, all right? It's 2, uh, and so uh, that means then that we have, um, that the, uh, uh, we have that the that the mu is equal to then negative e over the mass of the electron uh, times the spin of the electron. So that so every electron then has uh, a because the, the 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 g and the two cancel. So every electron has this magnetic moment magnetic moment of electron. And so um, then. Um, <clears throat> but if a magnetic moment, but if an electron has that magnetic moment, then we know that if we put it into a magnetic field, then we can find, then we can find the Hamiltonian. And the way we find Hamiltonian is to look at the classical energy. Classical energy, that's how we always find Hamiltonians. We start, we have to start somewhere, and we always start with the classical energy. And so, so if we have a magnetic field turned on, the magnetic field does not equal zero, then we know that classically we have an energy, uh, a, a classical Hamiltonian, which is equal to negative mu dot b. And this is something that you learn in classical mechanics or electricity and magnetism. Uh, you've all seen this before. Uh, and so what that means then is that our Hamiltonian is uh, what that means then is that in, in, in quantum mechanics, we take that classical Hamiltonian, we turn it into an operator. So in quantum mechanics, we'd say H is equal to uh, negative mu, where that's the operator, uh, and, and then we have the B field, uh, and, and B, we don't, we don't, we can just, that, that's just a field, so for, for, we're not doing field theory, so we'll just, so uh, that's not an operator. But because it's um, it's something that we set, uh, but the but the uh, it's not a property of the particle, uh, but the magnetic moment is a part of is is a, a property of the particle, so that's an operator, and so the Hamiltonian then will be 
um, uh, e over m s dot b. Okay, and so then we can see that um, the um, the Hamiltonian uh, is s dot b, and so then we can see that if if uh, b let's just let's not say if let's just let's just say that the magnetic let's just make the magnetic field uh, equal to uh, pointing in the z direction then what we have is this very famous uh, Hamiltonian which is that the Hamiltonian is um, e b over m times uh, s z so this then is our is our Hamiltonian for a particle, for an electron in a magnetic field, for E minus in a B field, uh, then we have the uh, Zeeman uh, Hamiltonian. We call this the Zeeman effect. <coughs> and so, um, and so, then we could say, okay, well, what does that mean then? What are the what are the allowed energies of a, of an electron in a magnetic field? Well, then we would say the allowed energies, the allowed energies, and, and this becomes important because this is what an experimentalist measures. We measure the energy. We can measure the energy of a particle. And so the allowed energies um, of an electron in a magnetic field are going to be uh, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So we got to figure out what those eigenvalues are. H um, psi n is equal to e n psi n. So we got to solve that, solve this. And then we can find the allowed energies because the allowed energies are going to be the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So these are the uh, eigenvalues, eigenvalues. Uh, and so let's find those eigenvalues. And so let's so so to find the allowed energies, we've got to find the eigenvalues. So let's do it. So H will replace H with this this thing, because that's what H is for an electron in the magnetic field. And so we see E B over M S Z times psi N um, is equal to uh, E times psi n, <clears throat> and so um, we have to uh, then figure out what are the uh, eigenstates of, of this, and so we see then that the eigenstates uh, of the Hamiltonian are going to be the same as the eigenstates of Sz, and so what are the eigenstates of Sz? Eigenstates, well we know what they are. The eigenstates of Sz is simply uh, plus and minus, because Sz times plus is equal to h bar over 2 plus, and we know that Sz times minus is equal to minus h bar over 2 minus. So uh, immediately we, we can see what the eigen... So then we can see that the eigenstates uh, have to be these guys, plus and minus. And so then we can see then that um, if we plug those in, Eb over m... S Z times plus uh, is equal to E times plus, and so and so what I'm going to get then is um, E B over M times H bar over two uh, is going to equal E, and so that's E plus, and similarly we can have minus E B H bar over two M is equal to E minus, and so we can immediately see. What the, eigen, what the energies are for an electron uh, in a magnetic field. So these are the energies for an electron in a B field. And so then we see then that uh, normally, so this is, so then the diagram that we write is this, we would say, um, we would say then if B field equals zero, then we, ha we can draw a line. If we draw, if this axis is energy, then we would say that the spin up states and the spin down states have the same energy for of an electron in zero magnetic field but if i turn on the magnetic field 
here, if I turn on the magnetic field, then I can see then that uh, I can have, uh, uh, I will have E plus uh, spin up will have a higher, higher energy than spin down. Okay, so we see that spin up has a higher energy uh, than spin down. Um, <clears throat> um, and so uh, we, so, and this splitting, of course, is going to be uh, uh, delta E is equal to just that, the, the difference between those two energies, which is just going to be EB over uh, M, EBH bar divided by M. Okay, so that, that's kind of all that I want to say for now. Uh, and we call this the Zeeman splitting. And so that's a kind of a, a lightning uh, review of spin. Um, and so, sorry for going so fast on that, uh, but I just want, well, maybe it wasn't that fast, but uh, just wanted to kind of give you guys that, that, that lightning review. And so now I'm gonna start the new, the new topic of the course, um, which is, um, um, <clears throat> the, the, the new material of the course, which is now, let's talk about uh, systems of identical particles. Okay, so now uh, we're moving into uh, a new topic, um, and, but it's still, but there's still some review going on. So just to kind of remind you, so uh, what we want to understand is what happens when we have many particles in quantum mechanics. Then what happens? Well, we call this uh, many-body physics. You might have heard of that word, or maybe not, but we call this many-body physics because there's many bodies. Um, and, um, and, and some funny things can happen. Funny stuff can happen. That's not obvious. Funny stuff can happen. It's, it's kind of cool. Uh, and the most important thing is that we get uh, symmetrization effects. Sy we need to, to do symmetrization of the many body wave function. And you might, those words might not mean anything to you now, but, but that's what we want to understand. All right, that's the purpose of, of, of what we're doing right now, is to understand what that means. Um, okay, so let's start right at the beginning. And so the beginning, of course, is what you learned in your last course, which is 137A. Because physics of 137A, uh, your first semester of quantum, basically was what we, would, what we like to call single particle, single particle uh, quantum mechanics. And single particle quantum mechanics basically means what is the physics of a single particle? And, and, you guide, and what you learned... Uh, is that <clears throat> what you learned last semester is that if you have a single particle, um, then the particle is described by, for example, the particle can be, can be described by a Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is the energy operator, and it has a kinetic energy plus a potential energy, right? And you remember that the kinetic energy is P squared over 2M, and the potential energy depends on the details. We'll just call it for we'll just call it v of x, and this is for one dimension, but it's it's easily generalizable to other dimensions as you did last semester. Um, and and we know that uh, that we can write in the position representation we can write the momentum operator uh, as uh, h bar over i uh, times d dx, right? For for one for one d, uh, and we know. Uh, you guys learned also that uh, the, ham the commutator between x and p uh, is not zero. It's, it's ih bar. Uh, so we cannot have simultaneous eigenvalues of those guys. Um, and also, um, to find the eigenstates, you guys did this. You find the eigenstates. <coughs> to find the eigenstates, what you did was you just had to solve this problem, h psi n is equal to e n psi n, right? Those are the eigenstates. Um, and, so, uh, and so you had to solve that. Um, and, so it, and so the, the eigenstates uh, depends, it depends on the details. It depends 
on which potential we're talking about. So you get different eigenstates for different potentials. And that pretty much summed up, you know, uh, physics uh, 137a. But there's a few more little details. <clears throat> for example, uh, we know that, for example, if we, if we, can fi if we find these eigenstates, uh, then we know that uh, if I take the nth eigenstate and I project it onto the state to be at x, the, the, uh, the bra x, then um, that I can call that psi n of x. And so then we know that uh, if that has some energy uh, uh, e n, if that's the nth eigenstate, then we know that we can write the wave function of a particle at some times t, some times t. We can decompose it into uh, all the different energy eigenstates. We'll call them psi n. Uh, <clears throat> and then of x, we can write it like this. And then you can take the, uh, this, the wave function at some time t equals 0. Um, and we know then that uh, we can each of these components is going to have a, a simple uh, time dependence, e n t over h bar. OK, and so, so w w because each eigenstate has a very simple time dependence, and so I can take the wave function at some times t and decompose it as a superposition of eigenstates. And that then allows us to write the time dependence of the wave function very e easily, like we just like I just did. Um, and so this should be a review from last semester. <clears throat> and if I want to know the probability, the probability to find a particle uh, at some position, probability density, then we know that the probability uh, density to find a particle at some location position at x is going to be equal to uh, psi star of x times psi of x, right? So that's the probability density. <clears throat> and, and so I could say that uh, I could look at the probability density at some times t, and I can write it like this, psi of x t. If I know the wave function of a particle at some times t, then the probability density is just psi star psi uh, at, at that same times t. And since, uh, since this is a probability density, then we know that it has to be normalized because probability must be normalized. And so what that means then is that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of rho uh, of xt dx has to equal 1. So in other words, the uh, because probability all the prob the probability all the different possibilities added up have to be one the probabilities because something's got to happen and so if I add them all up it equals one <clears throat> and so that means that the wave function has to be normalized <coughs> in order for uh, quantum mechanics to have a uh, meaningful probabilistic interpretation the wave function has to be normalized. <clears throat> so uh, psi is normalized. Okay, and so this is all review from last semester, but I'm just kind of reminding it of you because this is the, the sort of the starting point. And so if I if we add spin, then we can see that uh, we can then write <clears throat> a wave function. Um, uh, we we can write. Uh, our, our wave function then is equal to, we can have the, uh, uh, we can have the, the, the orbital part, but then we can also have uh, the spin part. So it's just a simple product. So we have what we call the orbital part, the, pos the part that depends on uh, position, and then the part that depends on spin. We just multiply them. Okay, so that's, so that's the, the wave function, so when we add spin. Um, okay, so this, this is sort of what you learned last semester, and so that, I think, kind of completes 137a. All right, but now, <clears throat> so let's, let's look at an example. And really, my favorite example is, for me, I think the nicest example is particle in a box. And what I'm right, what I'm doing right now, I just so just so it makes more sense, 
Uh, I'm, I'm just going over single particle quantum mechanics, just kind of reviewing what single particle quantum mechanics is, because now we're going to then go into many body quantum mechanics. But first, let's just remind ourselves what single particle quantum mechanics is. So <clears throat> single particle quantum mechanics is, let's say, an example of single particle quantum mechanics that you've all done is a particle in a box. So if this is my potential, and I have a box of size L, length L, and if the walls have infinite potential, then the particle is stuck. And the particle is just gonna bounce around. It's just gonna bounce around inside of there. Boing, 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 just one particle. I'll give it a label, one, one, same particle. It's just bouncing around in there. And so I could say, what, is the, uh, what are the uh, eigenstates? <clears throat> what are the allowed energies? Allowed energies in that box? Uh, and what are the states associated with those allowed energies? Well, you know how to solve that. You have to solve this. H psi n equals E n psi n. And then you get the allowed states and the allowed, the allowed energies and the states associated with them. So we solve this. And that's what you did last semester. And you know the answer. <clears throat> the answer is this. You found that the wave functions, the eigenstates, are... These guys, square root of 2 over L times uh, sine uh, n pi over L, n pi over L uh, times x, uh, where E n is equal to n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2 ml squared, 2 ml squared. I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. Who's trying to call me? Oh, God. <clears throat> I don't want to talk to him. Um, okay, so, um, all right. Uh, so, so, okay, so these are the allowed states and the allowed energies. Um, and, and so that's what you get for a single particle bouncing around in a box. And, and so you guys all have all done that. <clears throat> and that's really cool. Um, okay, but now... Uh, and, and this is and this of course is normalized. We normalized it to get that factor in front. And so it's all good. Uh, and these are the allowed energies for each of those states. And you guys have all did that. you guys have all done this. I know you have. Um, and so but now this is the new problem. okay, so now this is the new problem that we want to understand. What happens when we put a bunch of particles in the box? This is the new problem. Okay, finally we're getting to something really new. <clears throat> the new problem is what happens now when I have a bunch of particles in the box? Particle 1, particle 2, particle 3, particle 4, particle 5. Particle six, bunches of particles. What happens when all these particles are in the box at the same time? So now we have many particles at the same time. Then what happens? <laughs> what is the quantum mechanics of many particles? Then the quantum mechanics gives us what? How do we deal, how do we do quantum mechanics of a bunch of particles all at the same time? And <clears throat> And the bottom line is it's, it's kind of the same as what we did for the single particle. Kind of the same. Because quantum mechanics works. It's got to work. Otherwise, nothing makes sense. So what we do is, is it's the same. We, we have to then... Uh, the, the system is described by a wave function. System described by a wave function. But now the wave function is a many-body wave function, because now I have, uh, let's say I have n particles. Now I can describe the n particles with now a many-body wave function. And my many-body wave function has to then be some function of the position of all those particles. There's gonna be particle one sitting at x1, Particle 2 sitting at x2, particle 3, particle 4, etc. 
So this is the position of each particle. Particle number one is sitting at x1. Particle number two is sitting at x2. Particle number three is sitting at x3, etc. And so this is the many body wave function. And so <clears throat> because the, the postulates of quantum mechanics still works, still work. Postulates of quantum mechanics still work. They still work. So uh, all the little things still have to happen. You still have to have observables, observables, operators, wave functions. It's all the same. It still works. Quantum mechanics still works with many particles, but you just have to keep track of everything. And so uh, let's, let's generalize. So, so quantum mechanics can generalize to many particles. It generalizes. And so then <clears throat> what that means then is that we define the wave function. And so then what, what I can do is I can say the probability to find the particle, the part, but now it's not just one particle, it's many particles. The probability to find the particles at um, x1, if for the, part, the probability to find particle 1 at x1 and particle 2 at x2 and particle 3 at x3 etc where that's particle number one and that's particle number two and that's particle number three the probability to find the particles at particular locations in space is then going to be of course the probability density just like you defined before it's going to be rho x1 x2 x3 etc x xn <clears throat> which of course is going to be the same thing as before it's just going to be psi many body um, x1 x2 uh, star times psi many body of x1 x2 etc so it's just again psi star psi so we have the same probabilistic interpretation the same probability behavior probability behavior same so the same so quantum mechanics still has the same probabilistic interpretation as before the but we just have to keep track of all the particles okay and and, and so and so if if probability still works that means then that it has to be normalized because probability is always normalized so negative infinity to infinity uh, if we if we do all these integrals then uh, if I integrate the many body wave function, oops, let's put it on the bottom. If I integrate the many body wave function over all the possible positions of all the particles, dx1, dx2, dx3, dxn, then that integral has to equal you guessed it, one. Still normalized, just like before. So everything's good. Still normalized. Uh, and similarly, uh, we can write down, we, and similarly, we can still think of energies. So we still have energy of the many body. The, 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 what is the, we could say, what's the energy of the, of the system, of the many body system? Well, that can be represented by Hamiltonian. A many body Hamiltonian, just just like before, we're going to just add it up, and so uh, the and to get the Hamiltonian, we just uh, and, and we can just we can get the the many body Hamiltonian from the classical Hamiltonian, in the same way as before, we can get it from the classical Hamiltonian, uh, and so that means then that we just if we if we uh, if we try to write the classical Hamiltonian for a system of many particles, then we just add up the energies. And we just add them all up. And so we have particle one has some, um, some kinetic energy. And we have particle two has some kinetic energy. And we have particle three has some kinetic energy. And particle four, etc., all the way to the last one 
so their total kinetic energy, we can just add it all up. But then, of course, there's also the potential energy. <clears throat> and, that, and that's kind of where things can get more complicated, depending on the potential energy. But let's just write it down. Um, I can have potential energy of particle 1, particle 2, particle 3, and particle n. So, so we can write down the Hamiltonian pretty easily. It's, it's, it's actually not hard to write down the Hamiltonian. Solving it, on the other hand, can be quite hard. Finding the actual eigenstates can be quite hard. <clears throat> but, but still, all, all the details are still the same because um, I know that if I have the uh, position and uh, uh, I, I, I know the, I can still write down the, um, the uh, uh, momentum operator for the ith particle is still the same as before. It's still, uh, I can write it down as a, as a del operator, a, a, a derivative with respect to space. And, uh, and so if I have some particle, say the ith particle, uh, and I can ask, I can ask, does this uh, position operate, does the position operator commute with the momentum operator? And of course, um, they, it depends um, because this is a generalization. I can write this as uh, ih bar delta ij. And so this is, this is really actually quite simple. It's just basically saying, if I look at the position of say particle one and the momentum of particle two, then those things commute <clears throat> because uh, they're, they're, they're separate. They're se very separate quantities. There, there's no, uh, I don't have, the, uh, they're not uh, uh, complementary variables. Um, but if I have, uh, but if I'm looking at the position of particle one and the momentum of particle one, then that does not commute. Okay, and so, so if I'm looking at position momentum of different R particles, then that commutes just fine. But for the same particle, it does not commute. That's simply the meaning of this, uh, of this equation. Um, and so, uh, so now what we can do then <coughs> is we can ask ourselves, what are the allowed energies? allowed energies of the many body system and those allowed energies um, I, I get by just basically solving uh, the Schrodinger equation and here it is I take the Hamiltonian and I hit the Hamiltonian uh, on the uh, uh, on the the eigenstate, which is now of, of uh, a function of, of all, position of all the particles. And so then what I get back is the eigenenergy of that state, x1, x2, xn. So to, so to find the allowed energies, must we must solve this. To get the allowed energies, we just have to solve uh, the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the many-body system. So this should kind of make sense. This is really the same thing as what we did last time. Uh, it's just a very simple generalization. And, and once we know it, so once it's solved, then the, then the eigenstates then help us to, uh, <clears throat> to figure out... Um, Time to, then, then we can use them to find the time dependence. Because once you know uh, the eigenstates, then the time dependence becomes easy. Time dependence is easy if we have um, En and Psi N. Because once we have that, then we know that if Psi, if my wave function at t equals zero, is an eigenstate, even at, let's say a many body, uh, if my many body wave function at t equals zero is a many body eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, say this nth height eigenstate, x1, x2, x3, etc., <clears throat> then I know that <clears throat> my wave function at some time later, uh, t not equal to zero, at some time later, I know then that my uh, wave function will simply evolve in time in a very simple way 
I have the same spatial function. Oops, and let's get this right. Oops, dot n of x1, x2, etc. But now I just multiply a simple phase factor e to the negative i e n t over h bar. Okay, so so then we see that we have the same um, <clears throat> uh, evolution in time. So uh, same evolution in time as, as you've seen before. So this should look very familiar. So everything is, is, is kind of the same. So this is nice. So this, this should all be looking familiar. Okay, uh, but, but there's one thing that I just want you to uh, understand. And, and <clears throat> the thing that I want you to, to, to remember is that in the equations, in the equations, we put a label on the particles. In the, and I'm going to write this down, in the equations, for the equations to make sense, then each particle has a label. It's labeled. They all have, they all are labeled. Because if they're not labeled, then we can't write equations for them, right? We got to know which one is which. So the particles are labeled. They have little labels. Even if they're identical particles, they have labels. So if we have four electrons in the box, and, and they're bouncing around in some funky way via the rules of quantum mechanics, then each of those four electrons has labels. One, two, three, four. And if I want to write equations and Hamiltonians and wave functions, then I got to label the particles, okay? So, you, so in your mind, you should think of the system of many body particles. All the particles have labels. They got to have labels or else the equations have no meaning. Because I'm going to have particles. So for four particles, then if I write down the wave function for that, then the wave function is going to be some, the many body wave function is going to be a function of the position of particle one, the position of particle two, the position of particle three, and the position of particle four. Now that might just seem tr completely dumb and trivial, but as you'll see, it starts to become a little trickier as time goes on. So I just want you to, I want to set the stage for what's going to happen next. Uh, but before doing some, some fancy uh, f tricks, let's just do some, let's just do some very straightforward stuff. Let, let's ask a question. <clears throat> let's ask a question. Um, uh, let's ask the question, what, how do we actually find, let's actually find um, the, the eigenstates for a many body system. What is the, the what are the uh, many body eigenstates for a many body system and the allowed energies for a many body system? What, what are they? Let's actually find them. Um, uh, okay, so let's actually do a real problem. Now, this is, uh, it depends on the details, but this can either be really easy or really hard. So it's either <clears throat> super easy or, or it's super hard. There's really nothing in between. Super easy or super hard. The easy one, we can just do in a few minutes. The hard one, though, <laughs> the hard one, you do it and you get a Nobel Prize, all right? In fact, several Nobel Prizes have been given out by people who basically figured out the uh, many-body wave functions for hard systems. That, that's when you get a Nobel Prize. <clears throat> for example, superconductivity was an example. Um, okay, so uh, let, let's. So, what is the difference between easy and hard? Well, it all depends on the potential. Easy means that the particles have no interactions between them, no interactions. What does that mean? What that means is that the potential of all the, the potential, this function x one, the potential uh, which is a function of the position of all the particles is equal to just the potential of each one separately. Some function of position of particle one, the same function position of particle two, plus the same function position of particle three, plus etc. That's the easy case. So that's what it means. There's no interactions. 
And you can kind of understand what that is. It's like, that, that's like if I have, so an example of that would be particles in a box. Uh, for example, if I, ha here's the example of no interactions. I just put several particles in my box. They're bouncing around. They hit the walls, but they don't hit each other. Uh, no particle, particle interactions. They feel the potential that they're in, but they don't feel each other. So that's the easy case. No particle interactions. Then in this case, the potential uh, of all the particles is just going to be the sum of the, of the potential for each individual particle. Okay. <clears throat> but, uh, but now let's consider the hard case. The hard case is when um, the particles do have interactions. Uh, when the particles feel each other, then the potential, this function, does not equal this. And so then it becomes super hard. And, and the most famous example is Coulomb. Uh, the Coulomb interaction. A, a, an example would be the Coulomb ex interaction. Because you know that electrons have charge. And so the uh, potential that they each feel, um, I could say that the potential between two particles, x1, x2, is going to be, um, if they have charge, then it's going to be Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught uh, times the distance between them. I'll call it um, uh, X12, where that's the distance between them. And so now we see that this, uh, I cannot write this as um, uh, a function of X1 plus a function of X2. It doesn't work because here we have this because X1 uh, x12 is going to be equal to, is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, x2 minus x1. So, uh, and it's in the denominator. And so v of x1, x2 is equal to q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, I keep on having problems here. Uh, x2 minus x1. Okay, this absolute magnitude. So, so that okay. So you see that I cannot write it as a as a sum of uh, a function of x one and a function of uh, x two. It doesn't it doesn't work. Okay, so that's the hard case. And so, so um, the hard case is super hard. <laughs> so if the potent if the particles feel each other, then this is just too hard. And so. Um, th this is basically what people study. This is like uh, current topics of physics is to understand what happens when particles feel, feel each other. And so that, that's, that's sort of like cutting edge physics. And so that's not what we're going to do in this class. Um, you'll do that in graduate school. Um, okay, so uh, but what we can do in this class is we can treat it with perturbation theory. So we'll, we'll make approximations, perturbation theory. And that's something that we'll talk about later in, in this course. And basically, perturbation theory is just another word for making gross approximations. We'll make approximations to deal with this situation. So that's the hard case. So let's forget about the hard case, and let's just talk about the easy case. Let's do the easy case. So let's consider when there's no interactions. And let's ask the question then, what then, if there's no interactions, then what is the uh, uh, eigenenergies and eigenstates for uh, a system of many particles? And so let's consider this case, my favorite case. We just have a bunch of particles in a box. And so I'll call this, just to make this general, we can call this box, we can say that the box has some potential V of X. 
Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a hard wall box. It could be a soft wall. It could be, you know, all the potentials that you learned last semester. It could be a simple harmonic oscillator box. It could be anything, but just some potential. And they're all in there. And so I have n particles in that box. And that box has some potential landscape. I'll call this the potential landscape. And all the particles are sitting in that potential landscape. And so I want to know uh, what is uh, the, uh, eigen the many body eigenstates and the many body energies that are allowed. What are they? And so, uh, so we can do it. Let, let's solve it. And so what we have to do then is we, we have to find we have to find the many body Hamiltonian and then we have to solve this equation. We got to take the many body Hamiltonian and we got to hit it up against the many body eigenstate and it's got to give us a constant times the many body eigenstate, right? That's how it works. So we have to solve this to find the allowed energies and the states that are associated with them. Okay, well, let's do it. Let's actually solve it. <clears throat> because um, if the particles don't feel each other, then it's really easy to solve this. Because what we can do is we can write down that the... Um, um, w w we can just write down that the potential um, uh, of all the particles is going to be equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n, it's just going to be the potential of that each particle feels independently. So it's just a simple sum. And so that means then that the Hamiltonian uh, I can write uh, really easily uh, because the um, uh, I can just write it really, uh, really easily because now I know that the Hamil because now I know that the Hamiltonian um, is going to be equal to uh, basically the sum of all the kinetic energies, so p i squared over two m plus um, the sum of all the potential energies. So each particle independently has a kinetic energy, and it has a potential energy, and I just sum them up, and so and so that's my Hamiltonian. So. This is the easy case when no interactions between them. And so, so now I have the Hamiltonian, no interactions between them for this easy case. And so now what I can do is I can then just say, so to find, so to find uh, the eigenenergies and the eigenstates, I just have to now solve uh, my time in my time-independent Schrodinger equation. So uh, it's going to be, I take the, uh, <clears throat> I take the, the uh, Hamiltonian, I equals 1 to n, and uh, I, I take it, p i squared over 2m plus v of x i, and it's summed over all the n particles, and I hit it against my hypothetical uh, eigenstate, which is a function of all the uh, positions of all the particles, and then I and I know it's going to be equal to a constant times that same function. That's what an eigenstate is: x one, x two, da 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 da, x n. And I also got all I got to do is solve this equation. Now. This, of course, is a little bit tricky to solve. I mean, if because we know that uh, p i is equal to uh, h bar over i del sub i, so this is really a it's a partial differential equation, and it's actually sort of a complicated one. It's a partial differential equation. So now, partial differential equation. Okay. And so partial differential equations are, in general, pretty hard to solve. It's, it's now, now, it has re now what we have is a math problem. So we've got to solve this math problem. Uh, and so partial differential equations are pretty hard to solve. But we have some tricks. We have our favorite tricks. And, and sometimes when these, we have, there's, there's a bunch of tricks that we use to solve partial differential equations. But there's one trick that we love more than any other trick, our favorite trick, the physicist's favorite trick for solving partial differential equations. 
Um, and, and so our favorite trick is, can you guess? Separation of variables. We love separation of variables. This is the physicist's favorite math trick for solving uh, partial differential equations. And uh, I, I know that you all have seen separation of variables, but I don't remember. I don't know the last time you actually thought about it. Um, but I'll just uh, um, uh, but I'll uh, but I'll just remind you. Uh, so separation of variables basically is what we do is we assume that the solution psi n, which is the solution, we assume that this solution, uh, which is a function of all these different variables, we assume that it's a product of different functions, psi 1 of x1, psi 2 of x2, times psi, psi n of xn. Okay, so a product. And we make that assumption. And, and the thing is, this doesn't always work. It, it doesn't always work, but it does work. In some, some, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So the only way to, to know if it's going to work is to plug it in and just see if it works. Uh, and, and in this case, it does work. Uh, it, de it depends on the, on the nature of the potential, but uh, in this case, it will work. And so let's plug it in. And so what we're going to do, so to see if it works, to see if works, then you just plug it in and see what happens. Just plug it in. And we do that. Uh, we have a special way of doing it. Um, and what we do is we, um, we can just plug it in. And so we can take our Hamiltonian, 1, 2, n, uh, and we uh, have pi squared over 2m plus v of xi. We have that sum. And so that's the Hamiltonian, and it's going to act on, on this product state, this product, psi 2 of x2, psi n of xn is equal to... Um, E sub n, psi 1 of x1, psi 2 of x2, psi n of xn. Okay, and so we plug it in. Uh, and then what we do is, uh, we the trick then uh, that we always do for separation of variables is then we divide both sides by... Um, psi n equals psi 1 um, of x1, psi 2 of x2, psi n of xn. That's the trick. We divide both sides by, by the product, uh, and, and then, uh, but then when we do that, we see that everything divides out. It all cancels except... When, except for when this guy hits one of those guys. And so then we see then that what's going to happen <clears throat> is that we're going to have this sum, i equals 1 to n of, and, oh, now what's going to happen? They're all going to divide out except this one. We're going to have this uh, pi squared over 2m is going to act on this one, psi i of xi, uh, and that's the one that's not going to work because when this pi is a derivative acting on that, it doesn't divide out anymore because it's, it's changed. And so plus v of xi uh, is equal to, but on the right-hand side, they divide out. Now, I hope you can see that. Uh, and if this doesn't make sense to you, think about it. You know, stop the recording and go play around with it yourself to make sure that this makes sense to you. Um, and so, um, and where this, and so this is the trick. So this is a constant. 
and so the, and so this is the trick. Now, now here's the thing. This, this now we're going to do the separation of variables trick, and you, I know that you all have seen this trick before. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to tell you the trick is that this is this is a sum uh, of uh, uh, I can plug in I can plug in any value for x i into this sum and and these functions all have to um, add up to a constant then always adds to the same constant now the only way that this can work the only way it works it, it, it work can work if and only if this thing is equal to a constant. For this to work, then this thing, pi squared over 2m psi i of xi over psi i of xi plus v of xi, this thing has to equal a constant. I'll call it epsilon sub i, where this is a constant. That's the only way uh, that this equation for, for this equation to be true up here, this equation can only be true if this is true. So this must be true. All right, it's a mathematical uh, tautology, a theorem. Um, okay, so then if this is a constant, then that means then that I can multiply both sides, then I can multiply by uh, psi i of x, and what I end up with is that I have pi squared over 2m psi i of x um, plus uh, v of xi psi i of xi. is equal to epsilon i of x i uh, of psi i of x i. And so that is just the, the single particle Schrodinger equation that you learned before. And so then we see that um, psi i of x i is just, is just the normal solution of the Schrodinger equation this, of the regular Schrodinger equation, of the single particle Schrodinger equation, and epsilon i is the energy, the normal eigenenergy for a single particle, eigenenergy for a single particle. And so then what we see then is that, um, then what we have is that, um, we then have, we can then see that the, so then we have the answer because now we can see that the eigenstate psi n of x1, x2, x3, these are just the normal eigenstates. Uh, the eigenstates psi n1 of x1 times psi n2 of x2, etc. psi uh, n n of xn. So, so we see that the, the many-body eigenstate is just a product state, product of single particle eigenstates. And then we see that the, uh, the eigenenergies is, to get the eigenenergies, we go back to this equation, and we see that this, we have the sum of the epsilon i's from back here, remember, it comes from, from here because these guys each equals epsilon i, and so we have the sum of epsilon i, 1 to n, is equal to e n. And so we see then that the, the eigenenergy, the total eigenenergy is just the energy of the first particle plus the energy of the second particle plus the energy of the third particle, blah, 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 energy of the nth particle. And so this is the this is the many body 
uh, eigenstates. Many body eigenstates if no interactions. Okay, folks, uh, I, I realize I went a, a little bit over. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll have to... Uh, I'll have to stop here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you back that time next time. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, bye-bye.